Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 19 of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. We're a day late and about a half an hour late, but hey, we're on the air. So uh, I did have a little family emergency. My father-in-law uh, had some bad luck with his uh, schnauzer that he's had his whole life, and he's a teenage dog now. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, we had to rush him to Stillwater late Monday night, and then it became an all-day Tuesday deal. Uh, but the OSU uh, Pet Hospital, the emergency hospital, did a wonderful job in Stillwater. It just there wasn't much to do for him. Uh, so that's why we weren't on the air. My allergies are bothering me a little bit. But Tuesday and then tonight, uh, we have a lot of pictures to go through. Uh, this show could be a long show because I'm going to talk about my own family and myself, so I know a lot about the topic. Plus, we have about 150 pictures. If we lose internet connection or if something goes wrong technically, I'll try to get back on the air. If we don't, don't panic. We'll just do an episode two next week. If it happens in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll probably get on for sure. Uh, but if it's you know within an, if it's after an hour or so, we'll just uh, continue next week on episode 20, uh, part two. But I should be able to get everything in uh, first uh, tonight about Rourke's POAs. First, before we talk about that, I do want to talk about uh, the passing of uh, two very famous POA people, very different stories, uh, two great uh, ladies and POAs. Ruth Picoy, a lot of people called her uh, the first lady of POA. She was in a long time, and she continued in POAs uh, for a long time, up into her 80s. She passed away at 90-something just the other day. Uh, and she had, you know, the Picoy's ponies, and then, of course, she had his ponies at the end. She had an Appaloosa mare that really did a great job for her. She'd been in POAs 30-some years when she got that mare, but her name was His Fancy Feather, and she raised a lot of great POAs uh, from her. Of course, she's the breeder of Dual Plotted, who did a great job uh, in POAs, had some really nice POAs for uh, Miss Sharon Beck out in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. So, And then she raised some other well-known POAs as well. Now, she did uh, Ruth was one of the true characters of the breed. You know, she's actually more famous for some of the things she did and stuff than she is as a breeder. Uh, she bought and sold some great POAs, a lot of great POAs, changed hands through Rockwell City through her. And uh, if it wasn't for Ruth, a lot of POAs wouldn't have been hardshipped into POAs. Uh, she lived a pretty simple life, and I'm not knocking her by that. I'm actually praising her for that. She worked at the prison, and she raised her ponies, and that was her main thing. Uh, I read her obituary the other day, and it, it wasn't uh, much to the obituary, uh, but, you know, she, they could have talked a lot more about all her pony involvement because she really was a big supporter of the POA breed. Another uh, pretty good breeder we lost, great breeder, actually, the RBR POAs is the Bagwell family from Broken Arrow. They got into POAs a little later on. They had quarter horses in Oklahoma here, and then at the last Tulsa sale in 1994, uh, they saw JKA Supreme Scooter, bred by John Anderson. They fell in love with him. He was a few spot baby. Of course, he was a tremendous colt. Turned out to be a great sire. Some of his foals and grand foals were winning and showing this year, just the uh, last week at, in Tulsa, just right near where they were raised down the road in Broken Arrow. So Sue Bagwell uh, passed away. I believe she had a a pretty lengthy battle with cancer, and uh, she bred some great RBRs, the bun ponies, and most of the buns are from them. So uh, we want to uh, take a moment to remember those two great ladies uh, that did a lot of contributions to the POA breed. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about Rourke's POAs, and that was my family. That we started in Minnesota, my mom and dad. Uh, started out in uh, Montana. They were born and raised in Montana. Uh, I want to thank everybody for wishing me happy birthday. It is my birthday today, so it just so happens the show ended up on my birthday. Uh, one of our first POAs was Cripes Almighty came from Ruth. That's right, Cripes Almighty. Uh, Ruth was married to somebody named Cripes, was the last name, and she, Ruth, like I said, was a character. She named one of the POAs Cripes Almighty, and uh, Ruth's daughter told Jan Rogers the other day that that got a lot of attention. A lot of people talked about that. Then, of course, Ruth married Burley Picoy, and he was a, P a character in the POA breed. I never met Burley. Uh, he was kind of out of the picture by the time I come along in the early 80s, uh, mid-80s, and was showing and stuff. 
Uh, Ruth was by herself a lot throughout the 80s and all the 90s, and uh, she showed a lot of a lot of POAs, you know, she had his dirty dealer, his signal fire, his fancy carbine, some of those things. So I wanted to go back to that because some people are commenting. So sometimes I'll kind of lose track where I am because I'm looking at your feed. That's if the people are you watching this a week from now or months from now or whenever, this is a live show. So hi, Jan. When I say stuff like that, people are just commenting. Uh, so that's good. If you haven't went on Ecamm Live, go on Ecamm Live and register so I can see who you are, like Tracy jan terry from iowa i can see those people so i was a little later tonight because i knew tracy was running a little later because this wasn't the normal show uh it's usually on tuesdays and jeremy uh from kansas was had some stuff going on he wasn't going to get home from work till seven or so so hopefully he's getting on here so he can uh, watch this live okay let's go back to rooks POAs. so my mom and dad were born in the famous town of roundup montana a little bitty town about 50 miles from uh billings montana real western area uh, dad grew up uh, in a coal mining camp he loved horses and the western lifestyle uh, he went into the service of course him and mom were high school sweethearts and he went in the army uh, when the mine started going out he was 18 so he went to California and then he joined the service from there. Uh, they lived in LA, believe it or not, if you seen, know my dad, he didn't seem like a guy that rode a motorcycle to work in LA, but he drove a truck in LA for 10 or 11 years, raised my older two brothers there till they were about 12 and uh, I would say nine or 10. They were eight and 11 years older than me. When I was a year old, they moved to Minnesota and to a 10 acre, hobby farm later we added about eight acres we borrowed from a real good friend and a lot of some of our famous POAs grew up in those pastures uh, we you know they tried to raise pigs rabbits they even raised some five Hereford calves one year uh, my uncle and my dad found at least a bull and dad had bought five nice uh, heifers and they raised some beautiful Hereford calves but you know it just never dad always said uh, every time he went to raise something, the market either quit or just something bad happened, like the pig market fell out. And he said, uh, if he ever raised turkeys, the government would call off Thanksgiving. So, and that's what happened when we got into horses pretty serious in the 80s. You know, the oil field kind of crashed there for a while and POA prices went down, but we stuck with it. And of course, we've, we've been in and out of it a few times over the years. So, we really got going in 1982. And I'm going to put some pictures on the screen here so I put this on all I want to do is smell peppy and pet ponies so uh, the peppy company you uh, they're world champion that makes peppy I love the smell of this stuff I don't have horses now but I would like to just buy a can of it and spray it at the dealership because it's such a cool smell uh, but I grew up probably 20 some miles from where this was the owners of this company was and uh, it always said Shakopee Minnesota but it was actually style stable from Hutchison and at the Tulsa National Show National Congress just the other day I grabbed a can of it and I was showing my wife Monica I said this stuff is made uh, by the people by Hutchison but it'll say Shakopee and I grabbed the can and I was shocked to see they have changed the name now to Hutchison Minnesota and later phase two of Rourke's POAs in the 90s when we got back in it uh, we were in Dassel, and that was only the next town down, Highway 15, State Highway 15 in Minnesota is Hutchison. So I used to go down there to buy my stuff right from, from them and halters and ropes. So I just added that on there because I thought that's what I grew up doing. I wanted to pet ponies and smell peppies. So my dad bought some ponies, didn't know what POAs were. He bought some pinto ponies. And they weren't quite what he wanted. He wanted a stocky, like a little stock horse, pinto pony is what he thought he wanted. And somebody told him them were POAs. Well, we found out, of course, POAs were Appaloosa ponies, not pinto ponies. So he started getting rid of those. And one night, uh, they had a Hutchison sale in Hutchison, Minnesota, open sale, every, uh, like the third Monday or something, for years and years. John Barber was the great auctioneer. Him and Doug Sarl are two of the reasons I went to auctioneer school in 2013 I wanted to be an auctioneer ever since I was a kid and uh, anyway uh, one night this mare come through my two brothers and my dad and I were all at the sale and uh, 
She came through just a little under 46 inches, didn't have any papers, but a little kid, a lot younger than me, was uh, spinning her, a, a well-known horse, you know, trader, what we call horse jockey, had her. He's kind of a famous guy in Minnesota now. Uh, but anyway, he, he had probably a trailer load there, and she was one of them. And boy, she had a handle on her, and she was a cute little pony. And uh, we brought her home. Of course, all our neighbors said, well, she's a miniature quarter horse. Well, you know, she was really tiny compared to what we started breeding after that. But she was our first POA, and we tracked her down, found out who she was. Somebody bred a neighbor, bred a pony mare to an MP stallion that somebody in Minnesota had, and we believe she was the result. Now, that's her mane there. Not, that's not a pinnel mark. Somebody's told me, oh, she looks pinnel. That's her mane. My dad used to comb the manes out on her horses that just killed him when they started banning manes and cutting them so short because he loved the what you call reining manes now so she was a speed demon i didn't ride in shows i never rode in a show for points not once this was a rare picture here of me on a horse i was a halter guy i like to right away at eight nine ten years old i like to say hey let's breed this one to this one or i'd show dad a horse in a magazine or show him a mare in a catalog we should buy this one a lot of times he'd do stuff like that uh, but this little mare got us started this was her first baby and i'm jumping the gun a little bit but she was born in, he was born in 84 and he was late so we named him tardy tough uh, but one of the things that happened when we had that little mare is there was we found out there was a guy named Carl Owes, Owes that was, you know, probably 50, 60 miles from us. Dad called him up. He didn't know us from Adam, and uh, he told him about Speckles. That was the name of the mare. And he had bark at at the time, a snow cap, which, of course, we didn't know what a snow cap was then. And uh, he said, thanks for calling and all that, but, you know, he wasn't going to breed a great mare. So we became friends with him years later, you know, but at the time we're like, okay. So we, uh, we found out Wally Cates was from about four or five miles where we were living. That's where he had grown up. But now he was about, oh, probably 30 or 40 miles the other direction, closer to Minneapolis. And he had a stallion named Ceres Silver Prince. So we took this mare and bred her to Ceres Silver Prince, and she didn't take. But the thing that happened was he gave us a magazine. And that magazine introduced us to all kinds of people. And one of the people in it was Arnold and Dorothy Marker. Of course, Arnie passed away at a young age in the early 90s at about 54 years old. But the Markers had a stallion that was from Max Nebergall and went to California, made a good name for himself. And then in about 1980, right before we got in it, the Markers brought him to Minnesota. And his name was East Acres Tough to Beat. And when we pulled in the driveway, of the markers, I would say it was probably early 83. It was before breeding season, probably February of 83. Dad seen the stallion in, in a pen, and he said, that's what I'm talking about. That's the type of stock pony I want to raise right there. I always remember my dad saying that. Of course, my dad developed a hell of an eye for ponies and horses. You know, he grew up around all kinds of ponies and quarter horses and thoroughbreds, all kinds of ranch horses. He never wore a cowboy hat in his life. He always wore a working man's hat or a ball cap and uh, or none at all. But uh, he did develop. He became a great horseman as far as a, a breeder, and uh, he passed along some of that to me. But here's Tough to Beat when he was in California. The Mitchells had him, good time POAs. Like Tracy said, Markadot. If you remember the Markadots, that's the Markers who ended up buying tough to beat and this is him in minnesota and he's an own son of east acres double top and that's the bloodline we discovered that we really wanted so it's kind of funny how things work you know from arnie that changed everything like i say arnie marker introduced us to bud campbell bud campbell introduced us to max nebergall he introduced us to doc nemmers and the rest is history. So all those people had a big impact on our breeding program, and we ended up having an impact on some of their breeding programs, which is kind of cool. So after we met Arnie, he told us about Bud Campbell, who was, again, a true character in the POA breed. He probably would be censored nowadays, some of the jokes he did and stuff he talked about. But uh, he was a cool guy, World War II vet, the Campbell's POAs, Campbell's Dreamcatcher. Of course, he bred for a lot of Campbell's way before then. 
And he had this horse here who's Driftwood Series Tomahawk, and he was a household name in Minnesota. Everybody cut their teeth on breeding to Tomahawk. He wasn't the greatest color producer because of his big spots, but he was a beautiful animal. He was the grand champion stallion in 1974. That's Bud uh, showing him there. And, uh, of course, we bought him in, uh, well, we would have bought him in, let's see, 83. Yeah, we bought him in 83. And uh, here he is at our place. Of course, he was a 1970, so he's about 13 then, a fat pony. Of course, 83, you know, Double Tough had just passed away. Gold Prince was famous. This guy was 50 inches or under, so he was the pony, kind of the old pony look by then. And uh, we didn't keep him very long, but he was our start. And then everybody kind of figured out who we were because we bought Bud Campbell's famous tomahawk stud. So here I am as a young guy holding him. Of course, he was a handful for me. He was Danny Boy. He was fast, fast as lightning like Danny Boy was. But he wasn't shown in performance classes, but he would have been something else in games. Uh, but, you know, I was little and small. I'm probably, what, 10 years old there. So and I'm short. So but luckily he was. So anyway, I'm going to put the camera back on me. So one of the cool things about me telling our story is, you know, I wish I could for other stories too. I know the trips because I loved them when I was a little kid. Some of my fondest memories in life are the trips my dad and I took. And uh, after we bought Tomahawk from Bud, he wanted to use him. He had a lot of mares himself, and he had a lot of commitments from Minnesota people and some Midwest people to breed. So he said... He needed him for the 83 season. So we hauled some mares to him, but we didn't get to have him. Well, with that said, we get a phone call out of the blue one day, and it's Max Nebregal, who just went in the Hall of Fame last year in, uh, in 19, well, 19 or 20, I guess. And uh, he's the East Acres guy. He's the man that found East Acres Double Tough, who changed the POA breed. And he said, I understand you guys are starting to get in POAs, and I got some mares, and he told my dad about some mares and stuff and the stallion he had so we made a trip down to tipton iowa and i'll never forget that trip it was a 24-hour trip and we'll w mares that we had bought from up north in minnesota that weren't very good quality and they had babies on him and then we had some others we'd bought and sold quite a few poas trying to get better first they weren't very good they started to get a little better but the trip to max has changed everything and uh, we went down there and he had five mares in a pen, in a pasture, kind of. And uh, and then he had a big leopard stay, and he didn't have him with him. Well, that leopard stay was Chippetuff. And that's him there. He's taking Chippetuff as a baby. I didn't see that picture until a couple years ago, but he was a tremendous baby. He always had a huge hip on him way before his time. Of course, he was a granddaughter of Chippo Leo, and he happened to be an own son of the stallion we just met, East Acres Tough to Beat. So as fate would have it, we ended up seeing this own son of Tough to Beat, who turned out to be his most famous son. And we purchased five mares that day from Max. He acted like he was getting out of POAs. He didn't quite yet. Uh, but they were, uh, they were all bred to chip. Two of them had fold already. One mare had fold a uh, solid filly that was 12 days old, a bay filly. The other mare who turned out to be East Acres Arrow full, had fold a filly that turned out to be Sandy Tough Dots. And then the other three mares were in full. And I'll tell a story and I'll show you pictures later on. But we were trying to catch all the mares and we got them all caught. But Arrow was the alpha mare. She was the smallest of the group, but she was the most athletic. She was half Arabian. Uh, or a quarter Arabian, and she just floated. I remember fl her floating. She didn't have the best hawks in the world even then. She was a 78, so she was only like five years old. Already had had a couple foals. And Max put a 48-inch gate panel up. Never forget this. And you can imagine what they look like, those aluminum-looking gates. It wasn't a Sioux gate. It was the flat-type gate. And she'd come down this alley, and we were going to pin her off. All the other mares were already loaded, and... She never missed a beat. She just went whoop, right over that panel that he put up. And the eight-day-old foal that turned out to be Supreme Champion Sandy Tough Dots, she didn't miss a beat either. She just whoop, went right over the, the panel, didn't even touch it. And Dad's like, yep, I, I want them all. So I think we paid 500 or my dad did, 500 apiece for him. Of course, that was five. And then we gave him some mares 
we gave them, I think, three or four horses in that money. Uh, but, you know, we got all the babies to go with it. And, of course, Sandy turned out to be uh, something that would really the catalyst to our program uh, later on when uh, Susie Schultz made her a supreme champion and showed her all over the country, her family. We'll talk about that some more, of course. Uh, but that helped us get known. And that's what it takes uh, to become a well-known breeder. You just need some luck and you need some uh, stuff like that, some good horses, but you also need things to go your way. So this is Chip a Tough on our place here. And uh, actually, Susie Schultz is holding him here because uh, she was just a little better handler than me at the time. She was about a year older than me. I was probably 13, and she was 14 when this picture was taken. And uh, he was fat and full of piss and vinegar. But uh, the whole story goes... We, uh, we got those mares home, and uh, then that's when Bud said, well, you know, I need Tomahawk, and Tomahawk wouldn't have crossed that well with those mares anyway. The biggest mare of them was probably, oh, about 53 and a half, and uh, Chippetuff was pushing 54. Max always thought he was over, but when Arnie Marker uh, inspected him, he got him at like 53 and three quarters for his permanent papers. Uh, but anyway, Max called us again out of the blue and said, hey, Bud said, you can't have Tomahawk right away. Why don't you come back down and lease Chip? So I think Max met my dad somewhere by the border, and uh, dad didn't go all the way to Tipton that time. But anyway, and we leased Chip at first and had him. And, uh, and then after we had him on the place all summer, uh, Max made a deal to sell him to us. And dad said, oh, I can't afford him. You know, he's a grandson of Double Tough, and he's starting to get a name and everything. And, and Max said, oh, yeah, you can. And he priced them to us. And uh, dad bought him, and the rest is history. So that's a picture of him in 1985. He's a 77 model. This is him after breeding on a hot summer day. He's a lot skinnier here. This is in 87. We would have bought him in 83. So 85, 87, and then here he is again, dad holding him in 88 after we took, gave him a bath. This is, we got rid of him in 89 because, of course, Kiddo Tough was his heir apparent, our homebred, and he was a few spots, so he'd be a better color. He didn't usually throw that neck like that. The ch kiddo had a, a thick neck, too, a stud neck, but, and he usually didn't throw that head. I always thought he looked like a Napster or whatever, more than a, an Appaloosa with the big spots. Of course, he's heavy. He's got Siri breeding in him. And then Quarter Horse's grandma's a Quarter Horse, and she was bred to land in Siri's super spot. Uh, so, and then Double Tuff's on the top side. And this is the mare I was talking about that jumped over the fence. This is her in 1986. She did that in 1983. This is East Acres Arrow. She's one of the horses that taught me about snow caps at a young age. I realized they were great color producers and as good as, as few spots. I was saying that a lot when I was a kid, but a lot of people wouldn't listen to me. But that's fine. So uh, to wrap up the story, when we bought Arrow that day, uh, Max had a a barn with no windows in it and he said i got to show you something and if young people don't know what a dutch door is but a dutch door is a double door a bottom and a top and max opened the top and i remember it was rainy and cold it was really windy for iowa and dad and max looked in there and there was a little yearling in there and it was black swan s and she was all pretty slick and shiny but she didn't have a muscle on her she was really kind of high strung but she was beautiful looking she didn't look like she did later, all muscled, you know, and just a really nice stock POA. She looked like a whole different type. I think Max had just got her and had her in that barn shedding her out. And the wind blew that door on me and almost broke my neck. And I remember Dad yelling at Max. He'd just met the man, just bought five horses from him. But he was so protective of me, especially at that time. And, uh, you know, he was yelling. He said, you, you're going to kill my kid because that door come and just whacked me right in the back of the head. So, and then we took off with those mares, and Dad made it back without sleeping, made it all the way back to Minnesota, and the one mare foaled uh, the next day. The next day she foaled, so we had five mares and two babies, and three of the mares were pregnant in a big stock horse trailer, just a pole trailer. <laughs> it was a little different back then, but they were all safe, and they all lived. So, uh, in that trailer was, was mothers to Sandy Tough Dots, Susie Tough Dots, Ruby Tough Dots, Chips Lady, who's an air, so all four of them are national champions. And, of course, the mother to Kiddo Tough were all in that trailer. 
So, and I was like 11 years old riding shotgun with my dad. So that's a cool story. So there is Sandy Tough Dots. And uh, right away as a baby, we could tell she was one of the flashiest. And uh, she was really smart. And uh, she was really quick and easy to handle. And uh, that's my mom there. Dad and I were the horse people. And even, you know, when mom passed away, we would still sit up at night talking about horse stories and horse bloodlines and matings and stuff and mom would just roll her eyes because dad and i'd talk all the time about horses but she loved them she just didn't go to the shows much she hardly ever went to the shows but she cleaned stalls and she fed and she worked with babies and she loved the young ones and uh, this was sandy tough dots as a baby like we said we knew she was something special everybody around us we were lucky our our neighbor a mile away from us, so they live, you know, houses were about a mile away where I live. Uh, he was a rodeo champion, high school rodeo champion in like 56, and he was an auctioneer, and he was a farmer, and ran a little farmer there, and an, like I said, an auctioneer, and his son was a farrier. And anyway, he came, he would come and look at our POAs, and when he'd see a good one out there, he'd come in and say, boy, that's good and he, when he seen her as a yearling and two-year-old of course he hadn't been ever been to a national poa show or anything he's like that's the best poa i've ever seen well you know a lot of our neighbors would say that but they hadn't been to shows but she turned out to be a great poa and the story goes with her uh, my dad was uh, at a show and when i was with him in 1985 in austin minnesota and uh he seen Susie schultz was riding uh, WHC Ringo Starr and Joan had taken pictures of my dad and I at our first POA show in 83 in Winona and uh, she'd been real friendly to us and Susie was a friendly kid like I say she was just about a year older and dad kind of seen the writing on the wall some of the families in Minnesota had been purchasing young stuff like DA's King Leo came to Minnesota Black Swan House uh, Paul Passy made a deal with aggressives for CA's Amaretta and he kind of seen old Ringo was starting to, the age was catching up to him. He was a supreme champion, but uh, Susie's brother, Dick Schultz, who became a pilot, uh, he rode him, and uh, then Susie rode him. Susie rode other ones, too, before him, but she was ready for a junior horse, and Dad struck up a deal with the Schultz family, and there she is at the Schultz camper there with my family. That's my brother, Kirk, and his wife, Monica. That's Kirk's daughter, Jackie. Jackie's only eight years younger than me. This was in 1985 of a POA show. And then, of course, Dad and me. But there's Susie. And Susie made Sandy Tough Dots famous. She called her Dottie. We called her Sandy. But she didn't like Sandy because she thought it was like a dog's name. I think that had just come out like an Annie or something. There was a reason. She had a reason between us because of it. And that was fine. A lot of people around the country still remember Dottie. And uh, Schultz has showed all over the country she became the high point mayor a three-year-old mayor and i believe large mayor because they dropped the three-year-old class in 86 and but she was high point in the nation i still have the plaque like i say we owned her and we basically did like a lease deal and uh, like susie said the other night my dad was the brains of that operation but he trusted ron and joan and their daughter susie was such a good rider we wanted one of our young poas out in good hands and it was the best thing we ever did uh, because it was just promotion and pe everybody in Minnesota knew who we were right away. Tomahawk had helped, but like I say, he was a pony more, and this one was more of a, you know, what they were going for, the little horse look, you know, and she was by Chippa Tough, the stallion we wanted to promote. I believe this is out in Sioux Falls. She held her own in Halter, uh, but she was a good, good performance mare too, and uh, like I say, Susie knew how to how to ride, how to handle them. Sandy would, Tough Dots would, uh, you know, she had her moments. She was a mare, and she would, she would be cranky once in a while, but uh, Susie always knew how to handle her. So, so in 1986, she had Ruby Tough Dots, and we capitalized on the name and named her Ruby, and I, we hauled her down to Oklahoma City. She took third behind a couple Tough to Beat uh, a tough to beat granddaughter won it, and uh, then a tough to beat daughter was second of of uh, Arnie Markers out of a married bought from us. But anyway, we were third, and that was my first, you know, really good experience. We showed a 
a colt that year too at the national show he took fourth there was 10 in the class there was eight in the philly class but uh this is in i believe in mason city this picture was taken but you know we'd cut our teeth in 84 85 86 showing we showed a lot of babies we showed a couple of yearlings and we were showing against leonard lewis and paul passy well they were two of the best sh showers in the country and uh, they just happened to be in our state and i i'd get beat up pretty good by them and then at the futurity bud would come out bud campbell and he always had some good stuff so we went to the minnesota futurity at the leonard lewis place if you can tell in this picture there's something right above the flank or the where the croup starts there that's joan lewis's head she's rolling up the windows in that car park there because you can see the water behind us it's gushing if you blew this picture up you could see the rain in this picture it was downpouring when this was taken uh, but this was my first win ever and uh, that was in 86 and uh, one of our babies had won at a local show beat me showing susie was showing it for us and just because i couldn't lead in too and uh, she let in one colt i'll show him in a minute but ruby won and there was like i say two markers good ones that they were proud of and they were good fillies bud had campbell's birdie that became a famous mare and the mother to campbell's zippo in there and then a poco pixie was in the class she won the futurity the select sire futurity like a month month and a half later so uh you know it was a great experience so schultz has bought her because of the success they had with uh sandy tough dots so they bought her here's a you know she's fat and out of shape in this picture her neck looks really you know like a halflinger but it's a good family picture you know i'm a good looking guy there no i'm just like 13 years old so but uh, i thought that was a good family picture by our old rock wall there behind our old uh horse barn so but this picture was in the winter and when she shed out and got a neck sweat on her when schultz's took her home that's what they turned her into in a few months later and they campaigned i believe they showed her 32 times in 87 i think there was some rule like the top 30 shows that year because it was the trailer race there was some deal but anyway she was grand 28 times as a yearling out of 32 and she was shown in the state with black swan s who was the grand champion the year before so uh she showed she took third again at the international that year but she became our first national champion she won most colorful as a yearling and then her and Sandy Tough Dots combined. The year before, Susie and I showed them together for Produce a Dam, and Arrow took second behind Miss Gold or uh, Miss Hydeck. And then the next year, uh, she won it, and Miss Hydeck was in there again. So that was a big thing. East Acres Arrow became a national champion then as a broodmare. So Ruby became a, a pretty well-known mare. She went out to Michigan, I think. This is a cool picture of my dad and I here. This colt on the uh right was a stud colt by chip a tough and a quarter mare that we were just kind of boarding for years for my aunt and uncle and she was short only about 55 inches so we bred her to chip we bred her to tomahawk one year and she had a solid bay we bred her to chip and she had this loud colored colt and uh, that's the one susie showed in alexandria for us and she beat me i think i had kiddo and Carl was in the class i was second one day and i think Carl beat me one day but she won under all two or three judges and uh, he went out, Hughes's bought him, but I think he got pretty big. The filly on the uh, left was by a double L Dickens daughter that we bought from Jackie Blazer Guthrie. And so Jackie's the breeder. Her, we named her Total Treat. Unfortunately, her mom had uh, hurt her leg, busted her leg before she was born. We kept the mom alive long enough to raise her. And uh, she ended up being the mother to JBJ's Double Trouble. And also uh, definitely a dream sickle, I believe, is she's the mother of him there's a picture of my dad's in the background his body anyway that's my mom's hand and i took that picture she was probably about nine days old there so you see the scours she but beautiful headed and she was a jackie product jackie's been bre breeding cool pos for a long time so this is that colt that my dad was holding and this is robin hughes we hauled him all the way out to Indiana, got a $200 bid, and we hauled him back to Minnesota. <laughs> and then they came the next day. That's a nice fall, crisp day in Minnesota after the sale in October. And they came the next weekend and picked him up and hauled him to Hugo.
So this was another 86 full. This was a double uh, tough to beat full. We named him Double Shot. And uh, it's kind of funny. I'll say a couple trip stories again real quick. Uh, two of the trip stories is uh, when we first, after we leased Chippetuff, we went down, like I said, to Winona, 1983, to our first show. Dad and I went, I believe it was June 11th. Of course, you know my memory. I got a great memory. And uh, it was that weekend anyway, in 83. And uh, I would have been just turning uh, 11. I would have been 10 going on 11. And we got to see some good POAs. Well, there was a, a two-year-old out in the show. I don't know if she went grand or not, but she was nice looking. It caught Dad's eye, and he always... He'd go up to somebody, especially when we first were hungry, to learn information. He wanted to know who that was, and somebody said, well, that gentleman right there owns her. So Dad goes over, and I follow him. He's in the stands, and it turned out to be Larry Gibson, first time we met him. And My dad said, uh, they said, that's your filly. Yeah, her name's Chips Lady and, he'll, and something. And he said, uh, of course, she won the international show about a month after that show we were at and became the champion two-year-old. And uh, he said, She's sired by a stallion named East Acres Chippetuff. Have you ever heard of him? And my dad goes, yeah, I've heard of him. He said, he was kind of taken away. He said, oh, you have? And dad goes, yeah, I fed him this morning before we left for the show. I fed him in my, out and by my pasture. And he goes, oh, you don't own Chippetuff. And it was real funny. And anyway, it took a few years to pair relationships with Larry Gibson, but that was kind of a, a funny story there. And, uh, here we own the, the sire to his good mare, and, and he didn't know it. So that was one of the funny stories. Another funny story, which kind of ties us to talking about Ruth Pecoy, is in 1984, of course, my dad was working in Alaska. He worked 10 years in the oil field up there, and uh, he was friends with a guy from Texas that had some ranch bred mares, and dad looked at some pictures, snapshots, and liked the ones, so we went down there one spring uh, to look at them and on the way the Midwest sale was in Iowa that year I can't remember the town it might have been Des Moines or Ankeny or one of those towns who knows uh, but we stopped at the sale on the way and this would have been in 84 and uh, Bud Campbell had a yearling I believe he had a yearling colt and a two-year-old filly or vice versa and the colt was by Tomahawk and the filly was by Chippetuff and we're looking at him. We're standing there talking to Bud before we took off to head to Texas. And Ruth Pequoy comes walking up. And we'd been in POAs a couple of years then. We'd heard of Ruth, but we had never really met her. And uh, she said, Bud, by God, or however you know Ruth talk, by golly, the, uh, you have the two nicest POAs in the sale. It's young prospects. Of course, Bud and Bertie could really clip and fit up young horses. They never really got the credit for it, but they, they did a good job presenting their young stock. And uh, Bud said thanks or whatever. And my dad goes, well, I'm glad to hear that because I own the sire of both of them. And Ruth goes, well, I don't mean to be rude, sir, however she put it, but you own the sire of one of them, but you don't own the sire of the filly. Max Nebergall owns her. And my, it was kind of like the same story. You know, there wasn't Facebook back then, social media. We didn't advertise a lot. Here we'd had him for a year then. And my dad said, oh, I, we bought him last year. So that, you know, then people started to know, okay, Chippetuff had moved on, and he was in Minnesota. So anyway, we bought two mares from uh, the rancher down there in Texas. One of them was Bonnie Jolene, and she became the mother to Double Shot, who's in some good pedigrees. He's in some LVO pedigrees, and he's the sire to Driftwood's uh, Megabucks, Driftwood's Bonnie Jolene, a supreme champion from that Lewis has made a supreme champion. She got her name from the mare we picked up in Texas. Her name was Bonnie Jolene. We also picked up a mare that we hauled home and dad sold her the next week to Arnie Marker, and he raised some good Marcadot uh, tough to beat babies out of her, some really nice fillies. So this is him as a baby in Granite Falls, Minnesota. He was about probably five or six weeks here, but he he was a really nice colt. If he would have been, here he is in Iowa after he was gilded. Uh, Ray used him, bred him to four or five mares and gilded him and sold him to a family that wasn't in POAs. The cooks from Canada 
uh, got this picture from me from some girl that had him and showed him, but not in POAs. He's got a big belly there, but he had a nice little head and a huge hip on him, short back. If he would have been pushed, he who knows what he could have did in POAs. Uh, so, like I say, 1986 was kind of our coming out party. Uh, Sandy Tough Dots was doing really good. Ruby Tough Dots won the Minnesota Futurity. Dad had a colt at home he was really proud of. A few spot. By then, we did know what a few spot was. And uh, Kiddo Tough was that colt, and uh, we really liked him. So we went to the first Minnesota show in Austin, Minnesota in 87. And this is the result here. The first one there is Susie showing Sandy Tough Dots, and she won pretty much everything she entered in riding and stuff. The one behind her is Chip's Even Tougher, and he was the 1985 cross from Chip a Tough and East Acres Arrow. There's a big story about him coming up, and so he'd be the full brother to the one in front of him. Then that's my dad holding Kiddo Tough, and he's just a year old there, a young yearling too, probably about exactly a year old. Then that's Ruby Tough Dots uh, that... Uh, Stephanie Mollett was holding for uh, Schultz's because Joan Schultz was taking the picture, so she couldn't hold her, and Susie's in the picture. So that's uh, Stephanie's mom, Nancy Mollett, holding their gilding there, Chip's even tougher. And then that was a Chip a Tough filly on the end out of a uh, Autumn Supreme Bugs mare that the Caswells had. That was Caswell's first POA they bred. And, of course, they owned the bounce horses. This one didn't have any bounce in it. CR Tough Termite was her name. CR stood for Caswell Rorick. Long before the Oregon people used CR or long before Casas at Cannon River used CR, uh, Caswells and us raised a few kind of combined, and we, we put CR on them, but we never registered it. So she won the Phillies, uh, three out of four judges. Ruby won her yearling class. Total treat beat her uh, one day. And then uh, she she won the other, and she won grand, I think, every day but once. And then Kiddo got beat by a baby one day, but the other judges all put him grand. And then the gilding was grand like two or three times out of four judges. So they all won a lot, and they were all by chip -a -tough. So that's when we thought, okay, things are starting to get going pretty good, and that was in 87. So and Joan Schultz, like I said, took this picture. Her and Ron were very good uh, photographers they did weddings and stuff and they did a lot of horse pictures and uh, I, I have a whole album full of pictures just that they took of horses for us this is the chest shot here kiddo doesn't have his ears up but you see the long neck he had then he wasn't known for his neck as he got older uh, but there's not many pictures of kiddo tough unfortunately because he never showed after his yearling year just because he didn't there was no problems height wise or anything but uh, he never showed under saddle or anything, even though he was broke to drive and ride. Um, so here's, I just highlighted this picture. So these would be three-quarter brothers uh, by East Acres, out of East Acres mares and by Chippa Tough. And one was a two-year-old in this picture and gilded. And then Kiddo's a yearling with my dad, Pat Rourke, holding him. And you could kind of tell the balance and stuff even then. And a lot of people commented on how straight kiddo was his legs were so straight he kind of walked funny as a baby dad almost he had vets from the university of minnesota and all over come out to look at him uh, because when he'd walk as a baby he'd walk wide in the back and then when he'd trot they would come in and just be perfect and the one vet finally said you know i think his legs are so straight he just walks that way and he did that i think his whole life and of course it didn't stop him from becoming you know, the leading sire of the breed, so. So here's a head shot of Kiddo Tough. This is after Caswell's got him. Here he is. We were cleaning him up. Joan took this picture, Joan Schultz, in our barn. Like I said, it's not a very good picture of him. He's got a little uh, mud on his leg there, manure, and my dad's just in his big old Carhartt jacket, but... Uh, he was a good guy, Kiddo Tough. You see the rope on him and just a regular halter. You never needed a chain on him or anything. I bred him sometimes without a chain even. So this is Kiddo Tough's mother, East Acres Copper Blaze. This was three years before he was born. She wasn't a very good mother. She was a great-looking mare, beautiful head. And uh, she had the same grandsire 
is Cricket McHugh, uh, Mr. Little Buck from the Sharpings, was her grandsire. And this is a shot of her with kiddo. Of course, her eyes weren't glass eyes or blue eyes or anything. It's just a reflection of the, the light. But like I say, she had a, a cool head, and it showed up in kiddo. It fixed Chippa Tuff's big head. Here's the famous picture of kiddo. So we knew kiddo was pretty nice, and uh, we'd become friends with Doc Nemmers. He came up when he was a yearling, him and Ruth Ann. I don't even think they were married yet, and they came up to Minnesota. They had a doings to attend in the cities, I believe, and uh, they came up to our place and looked at kiddo, and he really liked him as a late yearling. It was probably right before Christmas, and he wanted to breed mares to him, so he leased him in uh he acted like he was going to breed 10 mares to him, and Dad said, I don't want to breed that many mares to him. So we bred one mare to him, double sweet, and then he got hauled down to Dubuque, Iowa, uh, for Doc to use him. And Doc ended up breeding, I think, three or four mares. He had three foals, I know, uh, or two foals down there. He didn't breed as many mares as he thought he was going to. Uh, but the result of those two became two Hall of Famers. And this is Kiddo's first full ever, the leopard. He is a leopard. It's just hard to tell. On the left there, closest to my mom, and that's the Crisco Kid. And he's probably 30 days old or so, but you can see the way his neck comes out of his shoulder and his little forearm, and that's not being pushed or anything. I mean, we fed our mares heavy grain-wise and good hay and pasture. But And then that colt on the other Side is by Chippa Tuff and out of Oz's Sweet Speculation, and I'll talk about her later. He never really developed that great. He didn't become famous or anything. His name's Chipulator. Uh, but the Crisco Kid, of course, became one of the winningest POAs ever and helped make Kiddo become so famous. So while he was born in Minnesota, his second foal, Kiddo's second foal, was born down in Iowa, and maybe Wisconsin by then, because Doc and Ruth Ann built their nice place over in uh, Wisconsin, Hazel Green, and Doc's Rough and Tough was born in 89. And the thing I think is so cool, they both became champions early. This is Crisco as a yearling. He wasn't shown. I remember Carl Laus saying he came and looked at him at Caswell's place and said, he, he would have won the national show. You should have took him. Well, he went as a two-year-old and won it won his class, and I think won junior. Of course, he won riding classes already as a two-year-old. And then Rough and Tough won as a yearling and a two-year-old uh, grand both years, the only two years he was ever shown at a national show. So I have a picture of every owner of Crisco, which I think is pretty cool. My mom and dad and I were the breeders of him, and there was a picture of mom with him. Here's Gordy Caswell with him. He bought him from us as a baby. Uh, dad had some health problems, and we had to move to town, kind of like the Alabama song. Uh, you know, move to town and whatever. And uh, so we did that for a few years till we got back on our feet and I got out of school. And then we went back to the country and started raising POAs again in the uh, probably about 92, 92, 93. We started getting horses again. But for a few years there, I graduated high school in 91. And uh, we were out of POAs for a couple years. We kind of had a few farmed out a little bit. Uh, but we weren't breeding real serious because we just, life happens. So this is Crisco with Gordy Caswell. He was our farrier, and uh, we met him in 82. He had the Bounce Appaloosas, another Bounce, and his sire, Leo Bounce Jr. They had Leo Bounce for a while. They didn't own him, but they had him with, on their place. But another Bounce is the one they showed. They showed him at the World Show in 82, and they promoted him. He won grand all over the midwest and men's western pleasure and women's western pleasure with gordy and veronica caswell they were big appaloosa people they consigned the crisco kid as a yearling gilding to the sale and he was purchased by newcomer then to the poas tracy porter of course tracy set the world on fire with him she trained him she deserves the credit for uh training him and getting him started and uh, she made it she won jpfc with him and halter and here she is in 91. He'd be a two-year-old there. Then her son Cody won a lot of stuff. I think they had to rent a U-Haul to haul those world belt buckles and trophies home. That would have been 94. And Cody and Crisco won a lot of national classes together. And it was time for him to move on. They sold him to Maggie Lagrasso. And Maggie Lagrasso from Decatur 
Illinois and the Crisco Kid became one of the toughest teams in POA history. And this is a picture of them in 2002 by Larry Williams. When Maggie aged out, she won uh, versatility with him and won high point, like I say, a lot of classes. There she is, her senior year, her senior picture. That's her graduation picture. Beautiful picture. Pretty classy there. Just a halter and a, a lead and no, no boots, no shoes. And Crisco don't even have his ears up all the way, but that's one of my favorite pictures of all time. So when it was time for Maggie to age out, they sold the Crisco kid to the Gallagher family of Michigan. And I always remember the story. Uh, Samantha Gallagher's mother told me they were at a horse expo or something. They were looking at some trailers, and they didn't really need another trailer, but they were thinking about getting one. And she told her daughter, well, for these prices, we could buy the Crisco kid instead of buying a trailer. And her daughter was riding, I think, a Driftwoods, Magic Monty or one of those, a leopard that she won. She was a good rider, too, uh, Sammy. And uh, she said, we could get the Crisco kid? Well, let's do it. So they went to Decatur, and uh, Ann, Ann LaGrasso was Maggie's mother, and they sold the Crisco kid to the Gallaghers of Michigan, and they became a tough team, too, and won a lot of classes with them. It didn't take long to uh, get going, and... Here he is in 2004, so I think the first year they were together. And then he stayed in Michigan, and this is one of the Wagner kids, uh, and he's still alive. You know, the mom there, she's still showing she's got some great POAs, uh, the, the chocolate doctor and stuff. She grew up in POAs, and uh, Chris, I just talked to her at the show in Tulsa the other day, and she said, yep. Crisco's still alive, and so is Rough and Tough. They're both 32 years old, and they were Kiddo Tough's first and second foals. So unfortunately, while Crisco was really catching on, we were kind of out of POAs for a little bit, and a lot of things started going it's good, and that's why I wanted to get back in it, because I realized now as a young man, I realized we could do this. We didn't have a lot of money, but we could get back in POAs and breed some good ones, so we did. Uh, I put this picture in here, though. This is a tough guy. He never became a real famous POA. Coulter's family bought him from us, and they said he was real, they really liked him, but then I think they kind of got out of POAs, and he floated around. He topped a Mideast sale one year uh, as an age gilding. But anyway, this mare here, this is another great story. The white gilding that I showed, the one I said was chips even tougher, he, uh, and they called him E.T., uh, they, the Nemers family named him, and I got a, another cool story here. In 1985, my dad had quit Alaska, and him and Mom had bought a little convenience store. And one night, Dad left to, to go help Mom lock up, so I would have been, well, 13, going on 13. The phone rang. Of course, back then, you had the cord, you were tethered to the wall. I remember we had a green farm phone hanging on the wall, and I say hello, it's probably about 9 o'clock at night, and this woman answered, or so, and uh, she was Jackie Nemers, and it was Doc Nemers' daughter. We didn't know Doc very well then. We had met him through Max, but uh, we didn't know him too good, and uh, Jackie started asking me questions. She knew we had Chipotuff, and she was asking about young stuff. I told her about Arrow and that we had Sandy Tough Dots, and she hadn't shown yet. She did a little as a yearling, but she, we hadn't made the deal with Schultz's yet. And uh, Doc came up, I think, with his daughter Kathy to look at Arrow and Sandy. And Dad priced Sandy to him for 1500 and he said, well, he wasn't going to pay that much for broodstock. Well, it was lucky for us that he didn't because she wouldn't have become a supreme champion, probably. She would have become a broodmare. Uh, but that little few spot was born, and... Dad said, well, I'll sell you Arrow, which I'm glad he didn't. But he, I always remember Doc's words. He said, you keep the factory, Pat. You keep the mom and dad, but sell me the baby. So they ended up striking up a deal to trade uh, that little few spot for a filly, like a yearling or a two-year-old filly, a solid filly from Doc's. So 
they left, and Jackie and Kathy, two of his daughters, came that fall. I always remember I had him all cleaned up, and we had him washed up. We were so nervous because Nemers was royalty in POAs, you know, even in 85. And I was just a 13-year-old, you know, young teenager. And uh, I had him standing by the mailbox when they pulled in. They couldn't believe it. They're like, you're showing him off for us? Well, anyway, they took him. Well, uh, we went down there then to look that fall. Dad and I did without a trailer just to look at stuff. And uh, or we might have brought a trailer. But I remember Doc had a football game to go to or something, so he wasn't there at first. And Jackie showed us a pin of yearlings. And Dad said, well, I don't mean to be rude, but I, you know, I, he didn't want any of them. So he just didn't like them. And uh, I spotted this mare, which I'm holding here two years later. And I said, Dad, find out about that mare. I think that's Doc's double suite. So dad started looking at her. She don't look too good in this picture because she's parked out, but she was a great mare. And she had already produced Doc's Bold Prince and Doc's Just as Tough. So by Gold Prince and then Just as Tough was by Tough Plotted, who that colt sold for $3,000 in uh, 83, our first sale we attended. So this was in 80, the fall of 85. And uh, Doc came then because I think Jackie went to the trailer house they had on that property in Dubuque and called him. And uh, he came out there and he goes, well, Pat, that's one of my best mares. And he said, well, I learned from George Bishop, you got to get, if you got win on a deal, I need some cash in this deal. And I can't remember what it was. It wasn't very much money, but he got the few spot colt and some, a little bit of cash. And we got Doc's double suite. Well, she became the mother of the Crisco kid. And, and that's because Doc sold her, sold her to us. And uh, so that's how that story happened. That's cool history and I got another story about her too a little later here but this was her in 80 87 with her uh actually this was 88 she had a bay filly in 87 by chip itself that was really nice we just didn't get much done with her we didn't get much done with this guy either and uh but they were really well made POAs kind of common headed double sweet kind of had a double tough head she was the full sister to Doc's tough dude that we always liked uh, so, and of course she was an own daughter, a double tough, and that was one of our goals to get an own daughter, a double tough. So this was another 88 baby. 88 was a good year for us. Uh, we had bet on bounce, which I'll show later. And this was Susie tough dots and, uh, doc numbers named this one and didn't even know it. Uh, he had chips even tougher and he never used him as a sire cause somebody kind of got to his ear a little bit told him he wasn't that good or anything so he said he had an overbite i don't believe he did but he gilded him and consigned him to a sale in a, a midwest poa sale and he got on the microphone doc and he said this is a full brother to the famous show mare Susie tough dots ridden by sandy schultz he switched the names sandy and Susie, and dad caught on to that so that's the next year when the, we already had Ruby Tough Dots in 86, so in 88, the next cross of those two, uh, we named her Susie Tough Dots. And here I am showing her. She kind of developed into more of an English-looking, long, long, lanky POA. She wasn't as husky as her full sisters. There she is as a yearling. Schultz has bought her from us, too, because they just love the line. They had so much success with Dottie, with Sandy Tough Dots. So this is Joan Schultz here. And she went on to Indiana, and this is uh, Jackie Carr when she was a, a youth showing Susie Tough Dots. She ended up winning three national classes at the national show. She was also a heck of a gamer later on in her life. She was a fast POA. So she'd be a chip -a tough daughter and out of East Acres Arrow. So the Tough Dots were actually about three-quarter sisters to Kiddo Tough. So this is just a, another Double L Dickens mare we had. Dad and I regret that we didn't get to cross uh, Kiddo Tough to our two Dickens daughters we had. The one, of course, passed away. This mare we bought right before uh, we had to sell this property here where she's on. And uh, that was a Chippa Tough filly we named Berry Sweet. And uh, instead of very, because that was strawberry blonde. And uh, we love the double L Dick and stuff. And we felt like kiddo crossed to those smooth built mares 
uh, would have really produced some performance POAs, but we never got to to live it out. So we sold Kiddo Tough to the Caswells, and uh, like I say, they were our he was our farrier, and they helped us out quite a bit. We bred to another bounce, and also Leo Bounce Jr. and uh, and then they bred to chip a tough and they started getting in POAs. They had a lot of apps. They started thinning out their apps and then they got rid of all their apps, all their app mares and went to POAs. Well, they got kiddo tough right at, you know, he was a three year old and they got him right when he was about to, to hit the big time. And unfortunately, uh, Gordy Caswell passed away the same year Arnie Marker did, or maybe it was the year before. Let's see. Arnie passed away in the spring of 92, and Gordy passed away in the fall of 92. And he was a young man, too, in his 50s. Worked hard all his life as a farrier. This is his funeral. My dad led Kiddo Tough with the saddle. That's my brother, Kirk, carrying one of his young daughters, who's 30-some years old now, uh, up to the church. And I'm in, I'm in the church. I was one of the pallbearers at the funeral. I was in college at the time, real hard time. So Veronica held on for a few years, but she made the decision to sell Kiddo. Again, Doc had leased him and bred a bunch of mares to him. He sent a few mares up to Caswell's, then he went and got him and bred him again. And uh, well, then in 93, she consigned him to the sale and Jackie Guthrie and the Krugers, that's Gordon Kruger and Danielle, uh, there they went in a partnership and bought him. And they were planning on to have us. We just went back out in the country, just bought an acreage in Dassel, and uh, about 12 miles or 20 miles or so south of where I'd grown up and where Kiddo was born. And they wanted us to take him and uh, kind of manage him and stuff. That was their plan. But we weren't really set up at the time, so we, we passed. We thanked, thanked them for the honor, but we passed at the time. But Kiddo had come back into our lives again, so... So now he was in Minnesota and Wisconsin as a partnership, and uh, they both did great things. There's a lot of K KBC, Kruger Bear Creek POAs because of this uh, partnership. And then, of course, Kiddo Bounce, which Jackie has made famous now, but he was bred by the Krugers, Kiddo Bounce. He doesn't carry the KBC, but KBC Kid Sister is the full sister to Kiddo Bounce. And uh, that's kind of funny. Jackie, you know, she follows the bloodline, so she got a hold of Kiddo Bonds and uh, has made him famous now. So Kiddo sold for, I believe, 5000 He topped the, the stallions that year in 93. So here's Rough and Tough. One is a two-year-old. There's a great breeder, Dean Damon. He bought him for like 825 bucks as a baby at the national sale. Again, the national sale is so important. Look at this beautiful two-year-old stallion, and he's still alive at 32, and he was consigned by a legendary breeder and to the sale in 89 and purchased by another great breeder who has now become you know, a legendary breeder, rival to Nemers, in fact. So uh, two great breeders there, and it's all because of the POA sale. So this is Doc's Rough and Tough. He won as a yearling, one grand. This is him as a two-year-old. He had stiff competition with Takapa Gold. Takapa Gold was the big, beautiful Palomino leopard, or you know, almost a Palomino and really rony leopard, pretty horse with the bright eyes brother breeding and and Gold Prince son. And then you had the little pretty red, you know, stallion, real smooth little pretty-headed kiddo son. And I always enjoyed watching them two go back and forth. Now, this was the last year Rough and Tough showed at the National. He didn't show again, and he stayed small. He probably would have set a record if Dean would have hauled him uh, to the National show for years. He did haul him in, uh, I believe, 93 to Iowa to the World Show, which was a tough World Show, and he won the World Small Class his first year he was eligible. Uh, but he never hauled him to the National show as a small stallion. But one wonders what might have been. But he became a famous sire. He's on the first page of the sires list. Here he is. He's a good-looking dude in his prime. Doc's rough and tough. There he is. Here's Kiddo Bounce. Bad picture. He, You know, he looks like a fat little pony. He's not very tall. He's a Kiddo Tough son and a Kiddo Tough grandson because another Bounce bred a Kiddo daughter to get his mother, Heaven O Bounce. And Heaven O is because of 
Gordon Ka- Gordy Caswell passing away, and uh, and then Kiddo bred that mare and got Kiddo Bounce, who's real hot, real good sire. Jackie's done a good job with him. Of course, the three-time grand champion mare the last three years, the daughter of, of Kiddo Bounce. So when we got back into POAs, this is the first POA we bought. And some really nice people from Minnesota was breeding a, a mare, a Bose My Daddy bred a Mr. XL Mac daughter out of a Bose My Daddy daughter. She was about a 55-inch blockbuster quarter horse mare, real short, not the beautiful headest mare in the world, not a great head. Uh, but they bred her to kiddo from when Caswell's had her and had him, I mean. And the first foal was born in 92, and she was born solid. And they were kind of disappointed. Well, we went and got her, and I was still in school and college at the time. But uh, this is we hauled her out to Detroit. She didn't do anything. But this became, I named her, Kiddo's My Daddy. I registered her and named her, but we're not the breeders. Uh, but she became the cornerstone for uh, the crier family, you know, in Wisconsin, the AKA POAs. So she's... She's the mother to, she became the mother to several few spots, and then she also became the mother to this guy, a.k.a. with intent to win. So who's become a champion sire now? But she ended up being a full sister to quite a few. Uh, that The Lewis family bought one of them. I had one, a Colt, and then I think Carl House ended up with a couple of them, and then I ended up, uh, leasing the mare and breeding her to kiddo in the late 90s and i got jag a national champion from the cross crystal smith from pennsylvania made him a national champion so here's a kiddo filly that had a few issues some stuff going on with the reproduction system if john anderson watches this show he'll remember she never even i uh, i never even sent in her papers because like i say she I, we hauled her out to breed her to Santee Winchester because my dad wanted to breed some short POAs, and she was about 50 inches, just a model of a little POA mare, and four white socks and a, a beautiful face. This was when we were back at, in, at the new place in Dassel, and uh, she was bred by Doc Nemers. I got a mare from Doc, and uh, Doc's Double D, and she was bred to Kiddo, and this was the result, and she was the first baby born on our Dassel place. And uh, anyway... Uh, John said she never came in heat, and she just kind of acted weird, and that's her half-sister by Takapa Gold. She had some issues like that, too. It wasn't Takapa or Kiddo's fault, so I think it had something to do with the mare. So I ended up getting rid of the mare and the two babies. It was some time wasted. Uh, they were both great-built mares, one a large mare by Takapa, and then one a little bitty mare. But I, I remember John Anderson, the breeder of J.K. Supreme Scooter, we unloaded the mare from the trailer, and he thought, I didn't know she looked like that. And I thought, I love this little mare, and she was a, a unique, cool-looking filly. So here she is again a little more. You can see she was pretty stout and had a clean neck. Uh, if I would have registered and showed her, she probably would have did well at the national show. She was born really buck-kneed really over on her knees. I ended up selling the mother to her, to Gene Carr, and he raised some uh, carbine babies out of her. So one of my big uh, fans, I'd say, or supporters, and I was a uh, fan of hers. I, I really loved Jackie Guthrie growing up watching her do what she was doing with her JBJs, and I had the opportunity to learn a lot from her and travel along. I called her my show mom a little bit, even though I was in my 20s. I was probably about 23 in this picture. This is her good JBJ's mare by Doc's Tough Dude. And uh, this was JBJ's Step Aside Boys that I'm holding. Larry Gibson showed her and won the baby class at that show. And I showed a colt by Kiddo Tough and not a Latches Shady Lady. Uh, and he won the colt class, and Larry won the Philly class. Well, then Larry... I think held the fill in, I held the mare, and mare and foal, and they won. But Jackie's holding her here. A nice picture of Jackie smiling there back in 1995 in Gordyville, Illinois. That was the first national show in Gordyville. Her first big, big show held there where the sales held now. So that's JBJ's Step Aside Boys as a baby. So let me take a drink of water. 
knock on wood the internet's working i haven't been looking at the hopefully we got a big crowd still i see janet just scrolled up but she mentioned kbc's kid sister i'm going to show a picture of matrix jan he's just in his uh working clothes in your barn there but i'll show a picture of him a little later but this is the next step in our story here in 1986 we went to ohio to xenia ohio and bought Oz of Sweet Speculation. We'd never seen her in person. We seen her on a video from the 85 National Show. She won in 82 and 84. In 85, she had a full on her side Sweet Patootie by Gold Prince, so she didn't win her class. But Dad was so taken by this, ma this mare, and she had such a beautiful head, and we wanted to breed good heads. And uh, Kiddo Tough was born that year that we bought her, actually a couple months after we bought her, not related, but he ended up throwing some good heads for us. But we wanted to really go in a head direction. And uh, she wasn't a very tall mare. You know, for a day, 54 was the, the limit. She was probably 52 and a half or so. They probably measured her taller than that. But nowadays, you'd almost get her in the small class, as you can see here. Uh, but she was a tremendous mare, had a long line of heads, the sweetheart head it was called lannan's ace of spades was her grandsire then lannan's sweetheart was her famous famous broodmare mother and then specs uh, was two-time grand champion back when a lot of mares weren't doing that and uh, anyway we purchased her for a broodmare and here she is kind of looks like a pony here but we bred her the when we bought her the height limit changed and dad was so disappointed so instead of breeding her to chip a tough he hauled her over to Caswell's and bred her to Leo Bounce Jr. And we bred three mares to Leo Bounce Jr. that year, East Acres Arrow, East Acres Copper Blaze, who's the mother to Kiddo Tough, and Oz of Sweet Speculation. Two of them didn't settle. Kiddo's mother had a hard time full settling. She only had two foals in her life that I believe know of. And Speculation didn't settle. And we were so disappointed. Then Arrow had a solid colt, and she was a snowcap, had a solid filly. So the next year, we didn't give up. In 87, we took her back to Caswell's and bred her to their bigger Appaloosa stay, and it was the biggest thing we'd bred to. But Dad said, if they want to raise the limit, we'll go for it. So we bred her to a 15-plus stay in another bounce. And the mare fold way early in January. I remember it was Martin Luther King Day. I got off the bus school bus. It was like 20, 30 below zero. And she was out there with the other mares, and it was probably about 4.30, and everything was fine. I went in, changed my clothes. Dad and I went out to bring the mares in and feed, and there was a colt stuck to the ground, and that was bet on bounce. And we got him in the barn, and he, he survived, but his legs were looked like pretzels. And I just this picture here, I want to show the hip on this little 52-inch mare. Look at that big hip. That was several years after she'd left the show ring. She hadn't shown in three years. She's just, a, we fed our brood mares well. So we had to bring him in the house. This is my dad here. That's probably the heaviest he ever was in his life. That's after he quit Alaska and had sold the, the convenience store. But this is Bob at a few hours old. We had to give him some several blood transfusions and bring him in the house. But he survived, but like I say, there wasn't a straight leg on him. But he had such a cool head and a cool color. And again, that's what Dad and I was trying to breed, some red and white ones. And, you know, he, he was born so early, all the other colts, we had a good full crop that year, like I said earlier. And uh, he kind of got forgotten. And about late in the summer, he looked like a sheep or a lamb. He had such long hair. And one of the horse neighbors, who ended up being kind of a well-known quarter horse person, uh, was making fun of him. And it kind of hurt my dad's feelings. And he got the clippers out, and he body clipped him, and this was the result. He's like, look at what was under that hair. You were making fun of him. Look at him there. He had a rupture as a baby, uh, but, you know, that everything that happened to him. And his legs started straightening out. This is him as a yearling. Again, we got rid of our POAs in 89 the first time, so uh, he was born in 88. We were, gonna, we were thinking about keeping him as a stallion, but we knew he probably wouldn't be the greatest color producer. And the state of Minnesota and the veterinary uh, 
hospital in Minnesota recommended that we gild him because of his rupture. But we sold him, and the Caswells used him for a stallion for a while, and then they sold him to the Rich family. First, Chris Sands leased him and rode him, did well in JPFC, took second at the national show in Halter, and the same day they rode JPFC Western, and he was second. And he got terribly sick that morning before the show, so he was kind of his haunches was kind of up a little bit. And I believe this is the day that young Teresa uh, from Teresa Rich from South Dakota got him. I think that's the the day. Anyway, he was a beautiful POA, and uh, his mother was famous, so I was glad that he ended up turning out so good. She had a pretty good career with him, and. Uh, here he is. This picture, he's not that tall. This picture has been retaken several times, and his legs look, he looks like a 17-hand hunter here. But he was in height, and he, he showed his whole life. The Kennedy family ended up buying him and uh, using him in Nebraska as a gilding uh, because Bunny Kennedy had bought a baby from him named Sweet and Bounce that was sired by him. And Sweet and Bounce became one of the cornerstones of the PAL breeding program and she was a daughter of uh, Bet on Bounce and out of East Acres Arrow who we'd sold the Caswells so the mother to the Tough Dots was the mother to Sweet and Bounce she did well at the Champ Show too in South Dakota so again that's Teresa Rich showing Bet on Bounce there's Sweet and Bounce bad photo but she won the world she won the national show I think twice in the small mares Good little small mare. This picture don't even do her justice. But she became the mother to Pal Son of a Bounce and quite a few others for the, the Kennedys that went on. So after we sold Oz's Sweet Speculation, we sold her. We, we held on to her for a while and boarded her out. We brought her back to another bounce. And, uh, we you know, she never had two foals in a row. And we ended up, and we... We didn't get a full out of her the first time, but then we ended up getting an 88 full. That was the first one for us. That few spot Colt Chipulator was an 89. And then in 90, I don't think she had a full, but in 91, she ended up having Bounce Back Jack. And we're the breeders of him. We sold the mare in full to Jeff Schumacher. And I'll show a picture of him here in a little while. And, uh, Jeff Schumacher fold out this colt, named him Ozzy Mo Bounce. And then the Canton family, Mike Canton, Twilight Canton from western Minnesota, purchased him as a baby. And Carmen Hoffman, she was Carmen Whiney back then, a well-known Appaloosa personality. She conditioned him as a yearling and showed him he was way ahead of his time. He won grand champion as a yearling. So in 90, the grand champion was by Kiddo Tough, and in 91... And then in 92, we were the breeders of the grand champion. So we were out of it, and it was just driving me nuts. I was in school, no money, you know, no horses. I wanted to get back in POA so bad because our stuff was really doing well and catching on. Of course, the Crisco Kid was doing well, and the Tough Dots was still around, especially Susie Tough Dots at that time. So here's, that's Mace in the background. You can't see him. He ended up riding a lot of rocking. And that's uh, Mike Canton. I wanted to give him credit because they're the people that owned him when he won grand. And then Gordy Caswell's uh, son and daughter-in-law, Larry, and Don Caswell ended up purchasing him when he was probably four or five. And I believe he might still be alive, but they raised a lot of POAs by him, a lot of good uh, kind of ranch-type POAs, trail-riding POAs. Some of them have went on to show. Of course, Ultimate Bounce is a son of his out in California. Lisa Reckon, beautiful national champion. And then uh, JBJ's Outback Jack that Jackie bought, the mare in full, uh, and named it JBJ's. Um, it won, I think, last year or this year at the national show, last year, I guess. Uh, and that's a son of this stallion here. Here he is with Larry Caswell when he's in the prime of his life. Again, he was only shown at one national show. One might wonder what would have been. Uh, the day this picture was taken, back then he would have done well. I remember uh, Jan and Dean Rogers came up to Minnesota for a visit, and they seen him, and he was a lot older than this. And he goes, you could sweat his neck off and haul him right now. He'd probably win grand. And that was after Takapa had won grand at 13. 
So he just had a massive body, not very tall. He looked like an Appaloosa pony, you know, across. He had speculations, dish little face, but then the jaw of an Appaloosa and uh, a real nice uh, build to him. So after Jeff Schumacher had Oz of Sweet speculation, he took her and bred her to a corridor stallion named Daz Daddy's Whiz Kid, and he ended up getting a filly, and this was it. And I ended up bringing her to my house and uh, kind of taking care of her a little bit. And I was going to try to show her, but I didn't. This is her as a yearling, and uh, that's a Takapa filly that I raised next to her. But she had that speculation head and a long neck, and uh, her dad was a quarter horse and owned son of Bo is my daddy. And I've been told by quarter horse people that he became a famous sire in Mexico. He became like the impressive of Mexico, siring a lot of halter horses. This is her. Again, she had a nice build, not a big mare. But anyway, we took this mare, and I bought the stud fee from Country Cusa. My dad was hauling horses. We had a horse hauling business, and he stopped at Morris's place in Oklahoma and seen this stallion that Morris's had. And he said, I found... A really nice corridor stud. He's not real big, not real, you know, not overly muscled, but I like the Kusa bloodline because I thought they were just profiled so nice. And then we like the bottom side of this horse. So we hauled uh, that filly, Jeff and I went in partners, and we brought her to Country Kusa. And here's Jeff Schumacher here with the colt that we ended up naming Country Wiz. Jeff and I was drinking one night at Caswell's, and we decided, I don't know if Don or Larry, one of the Caswell's, said, name him Wizen in the country. And Dad wouldn't have none of that. Of course, the thing, POAs was a lot different in the early 90s than it is today. It wasn't, you know, it was all youth pretty much. And he said, you're not going to name this colt Wizen in the country. So we ended up naming him Country Wiz. And this is him as a baby. He looked a lot like his uh, grandma. I was a sweet speculation, just with way more quarter horse. And uh, what I loved about this colt is the genetics in him. We took the mare Jeff bred that was half quarter horse and bred her to a quarter horse and got color and got and in height too. And uh, I took him home as a yearling or a late baby. This is him here right when I was starting to condition him. It was still, the grass was just starting to get green in Minnesota. You notice how I dressed? I don't dress much with the western boots and cowboy hats. I dress in sweatpants and a coat in Minnesota. He had a big body on him. This is him as a yearling. He became one of my favorite POAs of all time. And he didn't go on to do a lot. Doc Jones bought him as a yearling for the high selling price at the yearling sale. Gorgeous head on him. Great front end. Here he is the day uh, Jim Jones, Doc Jones, who had moved to Georgia, Bought, he bought him and the white mare from Doc. He broke the record buying her. They bought them together the same day. And uh, this colt sold for 3100 as a yearling. That would have been in 2000. I sold him and the Crimson Kid at the same sale, so that was a good full crop. And uh, Pikachu was born the same year. But, yeah, I always liked this colt. Doc Jones did send him to Pat Burton as a two-year-old. This is Pat standing him up here this is a picture taken off a copier piece of paper and it's been spilled on and stuff but this is him as a two-year-old they showed him i think four times as a two-year-old and he was undefeated and then one day they just pulled him out and stopped showing him he wasn't over height or anything like that and i think they ended up gilding him and i never heard from him again and it was kind of sad me he needed a tail extension his tail was chewed off he would have had a long corridor's tail but the Crimson Kid or Peekaboo, or I mean uh, Pikachu or somebody, a famous POA baby, chewed his tail. So here's his half brother. I ended up taking a daughter of East Acres Arrow and Bounce Back Jack. Her name was Ricochet Back to Bounce. The Caswells had bred. She was a snow cap, and I got her from Caswells, and we, we hauled her down to Country Coosa the next year. And he was a little different built. He wasn't as stout. Of course, he didn't have speculation. He did have speculation in him, but further back, because Jack, bounce back Jack, would have been his grandsire. But he didn't have Bo's my daddy in him. And he was stretched out a little more like the Coosas. This is him as a yearling. He had a beautiful, rich coat. I named him Nick Jack, 
My dad uh, got in a wreck when we were hauling horses on the Nickajack Dam by the Nickajack River in Tennessee. And because of Bounce Back Jack and the cross, the arrow, and the nick, I just named him Nickajack. Here he is. We hauled him down to Burton's. I partnered up with him. I said, I'll haul him down to you. You guys do something with him, and I'll give you half interest in him. So Pat took him. This would have been his two-year-old year. Uh, it's early there. That's probably January or February. He doesn't look that great in this picture. Pat said, don't get him, you know, too bulky. He had that real snaky looking head Arab, had Arab in him and Kusa in him. So he had a great head. But one of the reasons I shared this picture is because there's my dad, Pat Rourke, and then one of my great POA friends, Pat Burton, both great men. And uh, they're in this picture together. Uh, like I say, two, two good Pats there. So there's Pat. Look at the head. That was a two-year-old. And he was over height as a two-year-old. They conditioned him. He looked like a million bucks. They hauled him to the national show, and he was measured out. But then he came back to win a bunch, probably 10 or more classes as a gilding. So I don't have any pictures of him. But uh, he came to Oklahoma, to Edmond, and uh, the Morris family got him, and Hampton family because of their connection to him. And then, uh, of course, Maddie Dolan, great, great rider. I was fortunate for that family to get him. She won a lot of classes with him. Then he went away for a while, I think, to Vermont or somewhere, to a riding stable. And uh, the Brewers, who ironically live by the Nickajack River or Nickajack Dam, uh, they bought him. And they, their daughter ended up riding him. So he's been in some good hands. So he was born in Dassel at our place uh, in 2000. And also born that year was American Beauty. And I'd taken a mare I'd bought. I'd seen her an ad in the newspaper. I bought her for $600. And I brought her to Kiddo and got Peekaboo Street, who we'll be talking about a little bit here coming up. And uh, anyway, I brought her to an Appaloosa stallion trying for a home run. I brought her three times to this Appaloosa stallion. This was the first one. She was born in 2000 and her name's American Beauty, and I hauled her, I conditioned her myself, and uh, hauled her to, in 06, had Pat show her, first time I had somebody show for me, and uh, 17 broodmares in the class, some of them were, I think four of them were national champions, and I'm like, oh, if we get fifth, I'll be, you know, I would be disappointed, because I hauled down here to win it, that was in St. Louis, uh, but she won the class, and uh, she was a really nice looking mare, she became the mother to Evanescence, uh, two years before this picture was taken, she, Eva Evans from Tennessee had Evanescence. was a high point with her. Here's another. Here's a kiddo tough that we raised. This is the one I alluded to earlier, Jag. This is a young Pat Burton showing him. He was in uh, the 98 full crop. So I had Peekaboo Street and Jag, both national champions from the 98 crop. Here's Peekaboo Street, and this is her mother. That's the mare I bought as a two-year-old for $600. I gave the people $100 and said I had to go home and work on a fence, which I did. Dad built that fence, and Mom painted it. I didn't do any of the labor, but uh, I only gave them $100 because that's all I had. My next paycheck, I was probably making six-something an hour. My next paycheck, I took 250 out. The next paycheck, I took another 250. Dad and I made the half an hour drive. It was close. Like I said, it was in a newspaper. We went and bought this mare. She had uh, some mighty jet, mighty some bright eyes breeding from, uh, and it was early on uh, Sheldak Ranch breeding in the background. And then the little bit of POA she had was from. Uh, victors in her butt background on the bottom side and then she had some sugar bars breeding and uh so yep she's you're right tracy she's with kathy mckenzie of course peekaboo street went on to be uh darren vincent rode her and took second pretty much in everything to first impulse uh she was a beautiful she did win an international futurity class uh, but she had a ride against she was born the same year as first impulse and darren uh Darren was second to him. Of course, he was a game changer in POA, so I felt lucky about that. One of my fond memories is I was sitting all by myself in 2003 at the national show. I'd attended it to go to the board meeting, and I was watching the show. I, didn't, I drove an F-150 down there and uh, no trailer, 
And in comes the reigning 13 through 18, 40 entries. And I tried to judge the class, and it was a heck of a class, as you can imagine. Crisco Kid was in there with Maggie LaGrasso. I believe that was her last year. And I thought he won the class. And then Peekaboo Street was in there with Deanna McBride, Darren Vincent's daughter. And I said, I think these two went first and second. And they're both homebred, Rourke-bred POAs. And when they read the results, that's what happened. The Crisco Kid won, and Peekaboo Street was second. And I was all alone. I wish my dad would have been there to watch it. And I don't think I had a cell phone on me, but I was sitting there. I didn't tear up or anything, but I, I was so happy because the Crisco Kid was an 89 from our Kimball breeding program. And then Peekaboo was when we got back in it and was a 98 from our, our Dassel breeding program, both leopard offsprings, a kiddo out of uh, solid mares that we'd got. Here she is. She had that cluster of spots. I remember talking to Jean Carr when I registered her, saying, am I going to, you know, get some flack about this? And he said, no, nah, it's just the cluster. He, I told him over the phone. I described it to him. He said, no, nah, it's just a cluster of spots. It's nothing uh, pinot or paint. And, of course, he was right. There's been POAs like that. I think that always helped her on the rail a little bit, get some attention. This is her as a yearling. I sold her. She was the high-selling yearling. Uh, the Hoff family bought her in California. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. They're the ones that had Darren show her. They promoted her as a two-year-old. And uh, Lenny Hoff, Carol Cell Farms, had a lot of great POAs out there. She was a nice yearling and a nice, nice adult POA. Here she is. This was our Dassel property. I always liked the, that little, we had a little rolling acreage there with a lot of trees. A lot of POA people came out to Dassel. The cooks from Canada stayed there several weekends when they'd come to haul horses down to Iowa and different places. So this filly was the same year as Peekaboo Street, and this was this mare's uh, first filly, first baby. And a cool story about her, when Dad had speculation when we first got her and we were looking for a stallion, there was a Roman straw man in Easter Gentleman Cross, a little Appaloosa stallion, and he was tiny. He was probably 55, 56 inches, cool looking. They started putting him in reining training. And we went to the place where he was, and this woman had him, and she would raise wolves, if you can imagine. And I was like 16, 17 years old, and I was afraid of death of these wolves, even though they were in cages. And the woman was a little condescending. She didn't, we were trying to tell her speculation was a famous mare and stuff. And she said, oh, I don't breed ponies. So, you know, we ended up breeding to bounce and stuff. We didn't breed to that stallion. Well, as things come around, you know, karma, uh, that woman got sick and had to sell her horses. Later she passed away. But uh, some friends of mine that actually I grew up about a mile or two from them, they ended up having some good court horse and paints. They ended up getting her horses. And uh, this mare right here, this solid app mare, was one of them. And she wasn't registered. I had to end up CPing her. Because, and even though she was an own granddaughter, a Roman straw man, uh, she had four big white socks and a blaze. Not the prettiest headed mare, but kind of a nice mare. And uh, they wanted to sell her to me for quite a bit of money, and I refused. And then about six months later, I ended up getting her fairly cheap. That's her first filly by Kiddo Tough. That became Blazing Jewel. I hauled her to Wisconsin, and she was kind of a thin belt filly, but had a nice neck. And uh, I think there was 28 yearling fillies in the class, if you can imagine. And a friend, a good friend of mine, Charlie Bropes, filly broke their lead shank and ran around that class, if you remember. That would have been in 99. And uh, she slammed into the back of this filly. And this poor filly, it was the first time off the place. She was just a nervous wreck. She was shaking so bad and because uh, that filly slammed into her. And we ended up, we didn't get a call. Back then, they didn't. That was the last show, I believe, that they didn't do the placings for each judge. But she didn't place in the top ten. But she ended up going to Wisconsin. I think she was a brood mare. There's that mare. There's her mother. So the next foal out of this mare and kiddo tough became the famous, uh, the Crimson Kid, and this is him as a baby. And he became won the McLaren for charity and won the Leonard Lewis, the second Leonard Lewis. Uh, for charity. Okay, Tracy said explain CP for folks. Okay, so like this mare was bred to be an Appaloosa and she was solid and the woman passed away 
and then I bought her from somebody else. So when I went to get her, there was a breeding certificate, but it wasn't signed. So I contacted the app club. They wouldn't have nothing to do with it. And you had to be a registered animal at the time. For years, we had an open stud book where you could breed a grade to a registered. Uh, but back in the 90s, that was late 90s, that was starting to change. So they come up with a certified pedigree, which saved my bacon on this deal, and CP. So this mare, I could certify that she was not a paint. She wasn't a you know, anything like that. I could prove her pedigree, but I couldn't get her registered. So there's even a stud book that's just the certified pedigree horses. And uh, they were just horses eligible to breed. And it's out of, it's out of context now. I don't, they don't do it anymore. Uh, but they did it for a few years. And that's the mother to the Crisco kid. Now, if it wouldn't have been for the CP program, he wouldn't have been registrable. And there he is. I think our well water at the place made our horses get real dark. That might sound stupid to a veterinarian or somebody or a geneticist, but a lot of our horses would turn dark. And uh, he didn't run downhill that bad. My mom just took that picture, and uh, his hip was sticking up in the air. I remember when I sold him at the sale, his head as a yearling gilding, I'd just rock around with my arm around him. I didn't even have my hand on a rope. He was such a good guy, and he grew up to be a very good POA. He, uh, he was, I think the Schroeder family, or I forget their name. I might have tried. They were from Decatur. They won with him, won three-year-old gildings in, in uh, Western Pleasure, I think nine through 12. And then he went to Chelsea uh, Bain. Am I saying that right? In uh, Arizona. And she's the one that won the Lewis and the McLaren with him. Here's his full brother. And uh, his claim to fame is he was the high sell. Both these guys were high selling yearlings at the national sale. Uh, the other guy got two bids. The Koss family bought him. This one here, the Koss family bought him from me. Uh, one guy bid 2500 out of the blue. And uh, Doug started out at 5000 where, you know, and then da 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 And uh, Mike Berenger bid 2500 I think he was bidding for someone. And then uh, Koss thought I was running him, so they weren't going to bid on him and my friend pat burton stepped in and told the casa's trainer monty that cat's a live bid kent doesn't know sale his horses he's gonna sell so they bid one time and they won him for 2600 you know and i thought he'd sell for a lot more than that well then this colt wasn't quite as good as colt kathy mckenzie bought him from me he was very showy very flashy uh but he and he moved pretty good too but uh this is the showdown kid and he ended up selling for 5200 as a yearling. It's the highest price I ever got for a POA because, of course, we didn't break him out. Here he is at my our place there in Dassel on the hill. That whole place was a hill. Hard to get good pictures, but he was a pretty uh, correct-built, fancy, loud-colored POA. And here he is with two-fourths of the McKenzie clan. when they bought him in 03 at the sale. So here's a colt I got as a baby from uh, before we got Kiddo Tough back. We, uh, my dad went down and we, we picked up this colt and his mother. His mother was kind of a weedy looking mare, but she was an own daughter of Two-Eyed Thomas. She was a Boot Hills Tet Lady. Lynn Puffenberger had her. Uh, Lynn was uh, in partners with the Boot Hill guy from Kansas on quite a few POAs. And uh, this colt was born right around the time his dad, who became a Hall of Famer, Salty Gallaluk, had passed away. He got hit by lightning. And I brought him up to Minnesota, my dad did, just to condition him. I never thought I'd own him or anything. And he had such a great personality. And uh, if I would have known more and been hand, you know, more handy at things, I could have taught him to be a trick horse because... He was uh, really smart. He started rolling out. I had a wedding to go to the year he was a baby, so Dad hauled him back to Tulsa, and Lynn showed him. I showed that on the Salty thing a couple weeks ago in episode, and Lynn won the Red Earth Faturity with him. And Lynn didn't win many baby Faturities. He won everything else, you know, famous POA breeder, great records, uh, but he didn't have a lot of success with babies, so he really enjoyed that. And then he gave me half interest in him. I think he gave me like three or $400 for having him all summer and conditioning him and half interest. We sold him the year after he won. I sat on him for four years because he was tiny. 
And uh, we showed him his name, Salty Odd Look. I named him Salty Odd Look. So he's by Salty Got a Look and out of uh, Boot Hills Tet Lady. So what I was so proud about him is he's a 50 and on and under loud colored stallion. And both of his dad, his grandsires are court horses. A Wheeze Camp Palomino named Skip Sita is his grandsire and on the top side. And his uh, maternal grandsire is Two-Eyed Thomas, a court horse owned son of Two-Eyed Jack. So... But when Kiddo came along, again, opportunity to get Kiddo, uh, we sold him. Lynn said, yeah, let's put him in the sale. And a good family from Minnesota bought him. He's still alive. He's 24, I think, a national champion, little stay. And so here's that mare again. That, and that's just a picture of my dad with the coffee can. So this is a Kiddo daughter that Doc Nemers uh, was the breeder of, but I raised her. She was born on our place in Dassel. Like I say, she was the first one born. And then there's the mother to Country Wiz. And there's Talkity Talk, a Takapa Gold daughter that I bred this red mare's mother to, to Takapa and got a couple babies. I just threw this in because this is what kept us in POAs uh, so long in the 90s and 2000s. We started a horse hauling business. My dad worked his butt off. And mom ran the office, and I kept working, paying the bills, and making sure the business survived. My dad was 59 years old when we started that business, and he he drove miles. He put over 500,000 miles on that truck, and that was our second truck. We ended up running three trucks in 10 years, and I went to Texas every other week. And uh, then we got in a fight with Minnesota DOT. That's why I moved out of Minnesota, and I had to sell my ponies. Uh, because they ended up we got in a fight with them and now people do it all the time anybody that uh, offers to haul horses for money and you're not uh, with the dot you're doing what we did and uh, they they come down on us pretty hard but anyway that's what kept us in poas was rourke's horse song i ended up meeting the sheldak ranch people talking to them on the phone anyway dad got to go to all these places meet hollywood jack and uh dream finder when he was still in missouri and impressive andrew and uh not hollywood jack hollywood done it because dad put his hand on hollywood done it and called me up and said he's shorter than kiddo tough he goes he's way wider he's twice as wide but he said he's not 56 inches he said he's i've seen kiddo enough had my hand on his withers i know he's shorter than that so but anyway dad got to see the the country again and meet a lot of horse people and then i ran the office after the first three years I took over the office, retired mom, and then luckily I got to retire dad after a while and we used drivers. We ended up having three rigs with owner operators. I had three trailers, one truck, and then the other guys had a truck apiece, two other drivers. So we hauled about 600 horses a year, which is getting with it for a, a dually gooseneck, you know, not a semi. So my brother uh, wanted to raise a buckskin. So in 1998 he bought this palomino mare and i told him let's go breed it to abdul's grandson Heinrich's stallion and we might get a bucks again so we went in partners that was my brother's first attempt to breed in a poa he ended up breeding quite a few raised them on my mom and dad and my place in uh, dassel and uh, the hilly place again with the white fences and this is pikachu he was born in 1999 story of him is we were really proud of him as a baby his mom was very big we were afraid he might go over height so i went and uh, showed him in wisconsin since the show was so close my brother come over with his family to watch and we kind of made a little history there because uh daryl bilkey was one of the judges and john abrams and then a woman from california who i forget her name uh, but back then they didn't that was the last show i believe because i complained and put up a stink about it and they didn't say the placings for each judge. They just said your place. So there was, I think, 11 in the class. And, uh, yep, there was 11 in the class. Pat Burton congratulated me before the placings. Ken Steele come up and congratulated me. Larry Myers reached over and tapped my hat. They all said I won the class. Pat was in there with Determination Pays Off, and one of the judges put him first. But anyway, he ended up fifth place, this colt, and it was just heartbreaking. Well, then I found out uh, the judge from California put him first, but the two Oklahoma City or Oklahoma judges put him seventh and ninth. I still can't figure that out to this day. And 
Then he went to the Futurity, and he got, you know, the Futurity's a lot different deal, 50-some in the class there. He didn't, didn't do too good, but he was the high-selling weanling for 2,600 weanling colt. Uh, Nancy's family bought him, Roger and Barb and Nancy Hendricks, and they showed him, won the Midwest as a yearling and won the international show as a yearling gilding. Beautiful buckskin, Pikachu. They bought him because, you know, he was by their stallion. So, of course, they gilded him. And Tracy, yeah, not a judge. Well, you know, and that's, I complained so much. I believe it was 2000. Then I approached the board and uh, they changed it until you see now today, like we just experienced a week ago. It takes a little longer, but you get to hear all pl three placings. Because my brother went home figuring we were fifth place. Well, then I called him from a truck stop, again, before p cell phones, and I said, hey, one judge put us first, and two judges killed us. So, you know, ninth out of 11, that was, I don't know what happened there. But anyway, he ended up uh, winning. I think he won the Midwest probably, I don't know, five or six times. Unfortunately, Heinrichs didn't travel to Tennessee the three years it was in Tennessee, which was the prime of his life. So he missed the, the three, four, and five shows he didn't go to those national shows he come back in 2006 the first show in lake st louis and he was reserve grand he won the large tough gilding class and then the medium gilding that good m and palomino stat gilding who was at the show this year by the way as an old man he uh, he won grand that year and he was deserving he was a stout nice built palomino and then this buckskin with nancy was uh reserve grand and Nancy turned him into a barrel horse. There he is there. Because he's powerful, powerful POA. We didn't like breeding. Dad and I didn't like breeding little to big, and we never did. And they do it a lot now. We always tried to keep it. Uh, but we'd always go for a home run once in a while. That's why we bred to Appaloosas or Court Horses maybe one a year, one every couple of years to try to get something. And, you know, that's when you get something like this. His top line wasn't the greatest, but he was still a – a cool halter POA, pretty headed and long necked. So I'm running down to the end here, but this is uh, this is my Takapa filly again. She was never shown. I did register. She was shown as a baby. One judge put her second in Iowa Futurity. I held her down there. I entered her in that Futurity because Takapa was her sire, and I was glad I did because I got to see the Silver Kid then early as a baby before the select sire so i got to see him that he was a true few spot and all that i remember talking to dean and Corey about him and uh but this mare was grew up to be a well put together mare i ended up selling her when we got into the horse hauling business to to pay for some expenses to start a business but there again what might have been she was never shown after her baby year and she probably finished 55 inches she never come back into poa as i sold her at an open sale up in northern minnesota and I lost track of her. Here's the silver kid. Of course, we bred for his mother and his grandsire. So kids double sweet and the uh, full sister to the Crisco kid. And then kiddo tough is his grandsire on the bottom side. And he's beat his grandpa now. He's the leading sire the last few years. He will be for a long time. He's over 200 wins. The only sire over 200 wins at the national show as a sire. I just got some random pictures here. This is the Tabasco kid. This was a touch of 10 Tina uh, daughter. The mare was, and that's a kiddo full. Here's the get her done kid. So that other one was an 04. This would have been probably an 06. Kathy McKenzie bought him from me. He was really sick at the sale. He almost passed away. Lynn told Kathy he just needs some Oklahoma heat. He goes, and he grew up to be, I think he's still at one of the, the Edmund uh, stables there, so either Kathy or Ashley. So. Yep, Tracy, you have a kid's double sweet daughter for sure. That line has been true all these years through Doc Smith's Puff and then bred to Double Tough and got all those great ones, and then we were lucky enough to get part of it. This is the Diamond Bucks kid. And uh, when we got Kiddo back, we got him in late 2002. Gordon Kruger was nice enough not to try to make a fortune or syndicate him with somebody. And he offered him back to us for a, a nice price. I mean, it was still a good, you know, good enough price. 
But my brother and I partnered up and bought him back and put him on dad's place and where I live too. And uh, my brother got some mares together, some salty mares that he'd bought. And I uh, had some mares and dad did. And in 2003, kiddo would have been 17 years old. We bred 11 of our own mares to him. And several of them were two-year-olds, maybe four or five of them. And all 11 mares settled and all 11 mares fold the next year. I was so proud of that fact. Two of them were solid, two of mine, and I couldn't believe it, but they both colored out later. But I kind of took it money-wise on those two because they weren't colored. But this was the Diamond Bucks kid, and the story about her is she's a Mega Bucks daughter, uh, Driftwood's Mega Bucks, that we'd got because Mega Bucks was a son of double shot that I showed earlier the picture of he was born on our place and uh, when she was born we walked out we watched the mayor phone her in the afternoon and Kirk was there and my dad and, and I and uh, dad looks over I think it was dad or I one of us I think I seen it but I said there's a dime laying out here well right next to the afterbirth there was a dime laying out in the pasture in the grass and dad picked it up and he said well there's her name, the Diamond Bucks kid. So anyway, years later, this her roaned out, and she became a national champion in games. So in Tulsa here. So you never know. I sold her to Kathy McKenzie at the sale as well. She was kind of a stout little baby. She was 40 inches. She was so tiny, and she sold for 400 bucks. And she was well worth 400 Of course, Kathy would pay good money for other ones, too. But she uh, she has a good eye, and she always needs POAs for her stables. So, And she ended up years later paying off. Kiddo tough daughter. Here's the impulsive kid. There's a big story behind him. I won't go into all of it tonight, but... His mother actually was bred to be a replacement for Kiddo Tough if I would have kept going. I even named him Cam's, uh, hit the grandma of this one was Cam's Forever Gold, Melissa Slayton's great mare. And I struck up a deal with Melissa to breed her to Kiddo to try to get few spot to few spot, which you're not supposed to do, but we did it. And uh, to try to get a stallion for Kiddo, a replacement for him. And out come a filly instead. And, of course, she was a few spot. Well, then Melissa ended up breeding her to uh, Impulsive Zipper, one of those best stallions in Michigan, good bread stallion. And this is the result here. And he's going to make a name for himself in the breed for sure. He's got some age on him, uh, but the pony farm had him now. Uh, Nikki Seehafer has him in Wisconsin. She's going to breed him to some good mares. And he may become another kiddo bounce. You know, kiddo bounce was around for 10 years, didn't have hardly any registered foals. Now he's on the first page of the leading list. He's one of the top sires going. And uh, I think the impulsive kid might do the same thing. So grandson of kiddo, own son of a famous POA, grandson of a famous, famous few spot mare, Cam's Forever Gold. I was going to name that stud colt if it was a stud colt, this one's mother. Uh, forever kiddo i already had the name but you know it came out of philly so melissa got to keep it that was the deal she kept the philly and i was going to get the colt and pay her some money for a colt but she got the philly so this is a bad picture but this is the gold matrix dean jan rogers bred for him the kiddo bounces full sister dean picked her up he right before he passed away he picked up quite a few kiddo daughters to cross to his uh, impulsive horses and his gold Prince horses, of course. I always loved Tacapa Gold, so they bred Tacapa to that few spot. Marin got a few spot, and when right before Dean passed away, he told Jan, "You make sure you go with him, put him on some good mares." And of course, he's got double digits wins now. The Carnes from Wisconsin been doing a great job with his offspring. They did again this year. So, uh, again, a bad picture, but that's Jan Rogers is staying the Gold Matrix. Sired by Kiddo Tough. Here's an Appaloosa stallion that if we would have stayed in POAs, I might have showed him. He's a yearling here. He was he took like second under one judge at the Appaloosa show as a uh, weanling in the big show, and he won the Iowa Futurity, the prestigious Futurity. He was such a well-built, beautiful headed, long-necked colt, but Dad and I knew right away, looking at his uh, legs, he wasn't going to 
be big. So a friend of ours had him about 30 miles away from us, and we kept an eye on him. And as a yearling, we bought him. And another funny story, uh, not to get too negative or anything, but Ruth Picoy told me, well, Gene Carr said he has a long, ugly head. <laughs> and I said, have you ever seen him, Ruth? And she said, oh, no, but that's what Gene said. And I said, guess what? Gene's never seen him either. So I sent this picture to him. He didn't have a long head. He had a pretty head. So here he is as an aged horse. His croup maybe could have been a little longer, but it wasn't too bad. But he was all horse blood. And like I said, I was thinking about fitting him up. That's him in his skinny clothes there. Uh, but he ended up being the sire to Daisy Duke, who became a supreme champion. Uh, bred by Carrie Gervais, most famous POA she bred. She, she bred to Abdul's grandson and Santee Senator and Cody, Santee Cody. And then she went to breed to Kiddo right when Kiddo stopped breeding. So we took her good mare, her plotted bred mare from the victors and bred her to this guy. And out come Daisy Duke, who became a supreme champion. Well, I got to wrap it up pretty quick. It's 10 o'clock Tracy's time, so might be bedtime, but I do have a few more and I got to check my notes and see some of these were near misses. There's a good picture of my dad and that's that mare again, that kiddo daughter. There's an Appaloosa mare, had two of the best colts we ever had, but they weren't, they had problems and they, they both passed away, both snow caps. We named them Two-Tone Tough. And we we're going to call them Tony. They were born in nine. The mare carried the kiddo foals. She carried the first one a year and 18 days. So, and then he had issues. And then uh, the next year, we, we didn't breed her then. So we waited a year, brought her to kiddo again. We didn't own kiddo at the time. One year, we hauled her to Jackie's in Wisconsin. One year, we hauled her to Kruger's in Iota. Unbelievably, the second foal, she carried one year 19 days and we talked to many vets about inducing labor they all said no first foal was like a dummy foal we kept him alive but for a while but he didn't you know he couldn't nurse on his own second baby we kept alive for a long time but he had severe constricted tendons and again just being in the incubator too long i think and uh, but she was a great mare uh shell deck breeding she was a really heavy muscle bodied mare, about 56 inch Appaloosa mare. Here's a kiddo daughter called the Candy Ohio Kid. She was born while we weren't home. I hate that, but she was a kiddo daughter out of those 11 mares we bred. Her mother was, again, the people that had the small Appaloosa stallion, had a filly born that had a lot of the mare stepped on her. It was a fact of life daughter, and they bred that mare to Moonwalker One, who was a world champion. And out come this filly, and she didn't, not this filly, but her mother. And when she was two years old, she was probably 56 inches. Uh, she was NH. I just bred her to kiddo once to see. I tested this filly. She was NN. Then I got rid of the mare. And uh, anyway, this was a good-looking yearling filly. A little straight in the front legs, but snow cap mare, the Candy Ohio kid. I think there's some babies of her running around out there. She was born when we were at the Wilmer sale that, Jeremy knows he attended that sale, and uh, Lynn Puffenberger consigned a bunch each time. So did Bagwells and Doc Nemers, but uh, a lot of people. We had 88 entered in the first sale and then 60-some in the second sale, but it was uh, 2004 and 2006 were those sales. So when she was born in 2004 while we were at the sale. Here's some early pictures. I'm not even born yet on the left. That's my brothers. They were 11 and 8 years younger than me. Uh, one of the reasons Dad, I think, threw himself into POA so much is Kirk joined the Army in 81, and then he was gone for, you know, almost 8 years. We've seen him three or four times. And then the little guy in that picture, there's my brother Keith. And when I was 10, he passed away in a car wreck. He was 18. Uh, Dad always tells the story. Arnie Marker's house was the first house he was in. Uh, it was like three weeks or a month after Keith passed away, you know, because he, he just kind of stay at home and stuff. And that was the first place we was in, and that's when we were meeting them. So uh, we got into POAs pretty heavy, and I was kind of raised like an only child then with one brother gone and one brother gone in the service. There's Mom and Dad at Kirk's house, Kiddo Tufts Hall of Fame plaques behind them. That's a Christmas many years ago, but they were older, you know, in their 60s then. And there they are with their four granddaughters, all of Kirk's 
daughters. So here's a kiddo tough. This is, I mentioned, uh, kiddos, my daddy earlier. This is the Boston kid. He was a colt I conditioned. I wasn't the breeder of him. The Haley's were from Doug Haley from Hector, Minnesota. But I did, that was one of the really good condition jobs I did on a POA. One of the judges in Wisconsin put me ahead of Leonard Lewis with his full brother, Mr. XL Mac, or uh, what was his name? The XL kid, I forget, but something like that. He was the full brother, and he was really big. He was a two-year-old, and this was a yearling, and she put me grand. And she said that was one of the best conditioned POAs she's seen. I was young, so I had a lot of time. Then I was probably 23. There's uh, Country Wiz's mother that Jeff Schumacher owned when she started rowing out, and that's but she's only like three in that picture. And there's Talkity Talk, the Takapa Gold Docks Double D daughter. So I took this picture. I'm about ready to wrap up, but this picture was taken last year during COVID, and that round pen was made in 1988. When I was 16 years old, my brother just got home from the service. We dug those post holes with a tractor with an auger on it. And then we drilled holes in those posts and put that sucker rod that we'd got from Oklahoma inside the posts. And then a friend of ours made couplings, and we welded those together so they wouldn't come out in the sucker rod. And that was built in 88, and you see the gate wide open there. And uh, Kiddo Tough lunged in there. The Crisco kid learned how to lunge in that round pen, and it's still standing. You know, that place has not had a horse on it in years and years. They had llamas there for a while, I think, and maybe even ostriches, but uh, that's a 10-acre property with another eight hooked to it. But I was impressed last year in 2020 that that round pen was still standing up, so I just snapped a picture of it. There's a picture of us, when, of our, you know, the magnets. That guy in Iowa at the sale every year had those magnets, and we'd put them on the dualies. My brother had a dually, and I had a dually. So, of course, they'd usually slide off, and you'd end up losing them. But there's Kiddo Tough. Our claim to fame is, you know, we're the breeders of Kiddo Tough if we never done anything else. And there he is again. He became a great, great sire, and he was a great-minded stallion, too. I think that's what helped him was his foals were so trainable. Here's a shot of two of my nieces. The girl in the middle is a friend of theirs. She was a neighbor, and that's me in my barn clothes. That was taken in Dassel. That's an Abdul grandson uh, foal that my brother was after he raised Pikachu. He started raising quite a few. He raised a lot of bays trying to get another buckskin. Uh, but anyway, that's Jesse on the left and Jenny on the right. So Jenny's got three kids of her own now, so they're both grown women. Here's a picture of my brother in the middle and his two granddaughters. Them are Jenny's daughters there, Ari and Lily. The guy in the back's a friend of my brother's. He came to Oklahoma and bought a car from me, and that's my sister-in-law, Monica. They've been married since 1985. And then in the front there, Monica took the photo, so she's close up. So we're at my brother's a huge St. Cloud State fan. This picture was taken in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, we went up there one year and drove down to Mankato to, to go to an away game. So he's a season ticket holder. And I think this is probably one of the last pictures. But, uh, you know, my dad and I, we were the, the POA buddies, we, may, we spent a lot of miles together and a lot of hours making plans and coming up with names. He always argued that he named Kiddo Tough, and I said, well, I'll give you the Crisco Kid. You named him, but I'm the one that named Kiddo Tough. But this was a picture taken a few years ago during a Thanksgiving. I was already living in Oklahoma, but I think that's when Monica and I went down there or up there. And uh, just a good picture of my dad. No Hall of Fame picture. Tracy, sorry, that was just last week. So, And there's a picture of my wife and I. I still dress Western once in a while, even though I don't have any horses, but I figured I earned the right to, to wear a belt and a cowboy hat. So, All right, everybody, I'm glad you uh, you'd watched this show tonight. It was really personal for me. I didn't get emotional. 
I want to thank everybody for the birthday wishes. Unbelievably, this show aired on my birthday. I didn't think that was going to happen. It was supposed to air weeks ago, but with all, you know, different scheduling and stuff, and then my work schedule, it ended up being Wednesday night. I apologize. It's so late. The internet worked great. My first trip, Monica said. My wife's watching. Yeah, that was her first trip to Minnesota. We got She got to meet her crazy in-laws and see the giant ball of twine in Darwin, Minnesota. So, uh Anyway, Jan, Tracy, Terry, everybody that commented tonight. I know I missed a lot of people, but uh, thank you for watching. I'm ending it with uh, this because a lot of our POA history was, you know, my research and stuff too. And then doing this, I plan on doing this podcast. You know, I, I've created the leading sires and breeders list, wrote the book about POAs, the stallion book. And then, uh, of course, all the articles I wrote, read POAs, so. Uh, someday I may breed some more, but who knows? Right now it's cheaper just to uh, talk about them. So, uh, uh, thanks, my. I was talking about my crazy relatives, not yours. So, thanks, Terry, for saying a great show. And uh, I hope you enjoy the POA song, everybody. See you next week. Surprise topic. I'll come up with one.